Section One. Greek island holidays. Can I help you? Yes, I hope so. I have a friend who's just come back from Corfu, and she's recommended some apartments in Arilus. She thought they might be on your list. Arilus, Arilus. Let me see.、Uh, can you give me the names? Yes, the first Rose Garden Apartments. I'd like to go with another friend in the last week of October. Well, we've got a lovely studio flat available at that time. I'm sure you'd enjoy the entertainment program there too, with Greek dancing in the restaurant. And the cost for each of us? Two hundred and nineteen pounds. That sounds very reasonable. I'm just jotting down some notes now. The second one she mentioned was called Blue Bay. Blue Bay. Yes, in fact, that's very popular, and it has some special features. Really? The main attraction is the large swimming pool with salt water.、Mm, much healthier, I understand. That's right, and it isn't far from the beach either. Only three hundred meters. And only around half a kilometer to some shops, so you don't have to be too energetic. Is it much more expensive than the first one? Let me just check. I think at the time you want to go, it's around two hundred and sixty pounds.、Uh, no, two hundred and seventy-five pounds to be exact. Right, I've got that. Now there are just two more apartments to ask you about. Um, I can't read my own writing. Something to do with sun, sunshine, is it? I think you meant the sunshade apartments. They're on a mountainside. Any special features? Yes, each room has its own sun terrace, and there are shared barbecue facilities. Oh, sounds lovely. Yes, it is rather well equipped. It also provides water sports. It has its own beach. There are facilities for water skiing. Any kite surfing? My friend's quite keen. Not at the hotel, but I'm sure you'll find some in Arilus. There's also satellite TV in the apartments. And how much is that one? Four hundred and ninety pounds with two sharing. You mean two hundred and forty-five pounds each? I'm afraid not. Each person has to pay that amount, and there must be at least two in an apartment. Oh, I don't think that would be within our budget, unfortunately. And the last one sounds a bit expensive too. The Grand. Actually, it's quite reasonable. It's an older style house with Greek paintings in every room and a balcony outside. Sounds nice. What are the views like? Well, there are forests all round, and they hide a supermarket just down the road, so that's very useful for all your shopping needs.、Uh, there's a disco in the area too. And the price? Three hundred and nineteen pounds at that time. But if you leave it till November, it goes down by forty percent.、Mm, too late, I'm afraid. Well, why don't I send you a brochure with full details, Miss Nash? But don't worry about that. I'm coming to Upminster soon, and I'll call and get one. I just wanted to get an idea first. Well, that's fine.、Uh, we've got plenty here when you come. If you've got a minute, could I just check a couple of points about insurance? I got one policy through the post, but I'd like to see if yours is better. Fine.、Uh, what would you like to know? Well, the one I've got has benefits, and then the maximum amount you can claim. Is that like yours? Yes, that's how most of them are. Well, the first thing is cancellation. If the holiday's cancelled on the policy I've got, you can claim eight thousand pounds. We can improve on that, Miss Nash. Uh, for Greek island holidays, our maximum is ten thousand pounds. That's good. Of course, our holiday won't even cost one thousand pounds together. It's still sensible to have good cover. Now, if you go to hospital, we allow six hundred pounds. Yes, mine's similar. And we also allow a relative to travel to your holiday resort. My policy just says their representative will help you. You can see there's another difference there. And what happens if you don't get on the plane?、Uh, nothing, as far as I can see on this form. Don't you have、uh, missed departure? No, I'll just jot that down. We pay up to a thousand pounds for that, depending on the reason, and we're particularly generous about loss of personal belongings, up to three thousand pounds, but not more than five hundred pounds for a single item. 
Then I'd better not take my laptop. Not unless you insure it separately. Okay. Thanks very much for your time. You've really been helpful. Can I get back to you? Your name is Ben Ludlow. That's L U D L O W. I'm the assistant manager here. I'll give you my number. It's o eight one two six o five four three two one six. But didn't I phone o eight one two six o five six seven two nine four? That's what I've got on the paper. That's the main switchboard. I've given you my direct line. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Section two. For the second in our series about locally run businesses, we meet Simon Winridge, co-founder of the hugely successful Winridge Forest Railway Park. Welcome, Simon. Now, perhaps you can begin by telling us a little bit about how it all started. Well, during the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land, and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon, we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains, and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger-scale models of locomotives, but we didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham, and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway, and we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month, because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> I dealt with park business, and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife, and by making cuttings through the rock.、Uh, nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area, with fifty thousand visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park and makes sure the visitors are kept fed and watered, which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs.、Mm -hmm. So, have you finished your development of the site for the moment? Not at all. We are constantly looking for ways to offer more to our visitors.、Mm -hmm. The railway remains the central feature, and there's now 1.2 kilometers of the line laid. But we'd like to lay more. Because of the geology of the area, our greatest problem is digging tunnels. But we're gradually overcoming that. We're also very pleased with a new installation of the go kart arena, which is 120 square meters in area.、Oh. Again, the problem is the geology. We had to level the mounds on the track for safety reasons. We wanted to enable five to twelve-year-olds to use the go karts, and the main attraction here is the Formula One kart. We've known fights to break out over who gets it, <laughs> and then finally. To our most recent development, which is the landscape swimming. Section three. Ah, Caroline, come on in, sit down. Thanks. So, how's the dissertation planning going? Well, Doctor Shulman, I'm still having a lot of trouble deciding on a title. Well, that's perfectly normal at this stage, and this is what your tutorials will help you to do. Right. 
What we'll do is jot down some points that might help you in your decision. First of all, you have chosen your general topic area, haven't you? Yes. It's the fishing industry. Oh, yes. That was one of the areas you mentioned. Now, what aspects of the course are you good at? Well, I think I'm coping well with statistics, and I'm never bored by it. Good. Anything else? Well, I found computer modelling fascinating.、Mm -hmm. I have no problem following what's being taught, whereas quite a few of my classmates find it difficult. Well, that's very good. Do you think these might be areas you could bring into your dissertation? Oh, yes, if possible. It's just that I'm having difficulty thinking how I can do that. You see, I feel I don't have sufficient background information. I see. Well, do you take notes? <sighs> I'm very weak at note taking.、Mm -hmm. My teachers always used to say that. Well, I think you really need to work on these weaknesses before you go any further. What do you suggest? Well, I can go through the possible strategies with you and let you decide where to go from there. Okay, thanks. Well, some people find it helpful to organize peer group discussions. You know, each week a different person studies a different topic and shares it with the group. Oh, right. It really helps build confidence. Yeah. You know, having to present something to others. I can see that. The drawback is that everyone in the group seems to share the same ideas. They keep being repeated in all the dissertations. Okay. You could also try a service called Student Support.、Mm -hmm. It's designed to give you a structured program over a number of weeks to develop your skills. Sounds good. Yes. Unfortunately, there are only a few places. Ah. But it's worth looking into. Yes, of course. I know I've got to work on my study skills. And then there are several study skills books you can consult. Right. They'll be a good source of reference. But the problem is, they are sometimes too general. Yes, that's what I've found. Other than that,、uh, I would strongly advise quite simple ideas,、uh, like using a card index. Well, yes, I've never done that before.、Uh, it's simple, but it really works because you have to get points down in a small space.、Hmm. Another thing I always advise is don't just take your notes and forget about them. Read everything three times. That'll really fix them in your mind. Yes, I can see it would take discipline, but well, if you establish good study skills at this stage, they'll be with you all your life. Oh yes, I completely agree.、Mm. It's just that I don't seem to be able to discipline myself. I need to talk things over.、Mm, well,、uh, we'll be continuing these tutorials, of course.、Uh, let's arrange next month's now. Let's see.、Um, I can see you virtually any time during the week starting、uh, the twenty-second of January. Um. What about the twenty-fourth? I'm、mm. free in the afternoon.、Uh, sorry, I'm booked then.、Mm. Uh, what about the following day? Uh, the Thursday,、yeah. I can make the morning. Fine, we'll go for the twenty-fifth then. That's great. Thanks. Section four. Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction, but today I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house. Which is constructed more or less under the ground, and one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible, but at the same time. They wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot. 
on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself, with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping south-facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, what is of interest to us about this project? Is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing: light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun. And generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, and it is possible that in future the house may even generate an electricity surplus, and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood, and the owners. Haven't bought a single item of new furniture; they just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds, which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment, mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared, and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything environmentally. I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So. Eco housing like this is likely to become much more. Section one. Good evening, King's Restaurant.、Uh, good evening. I'm ringing about the job. I understand you have vacant. Oh yes. I'd like to find out a few more details, if I may. Yes, of course. Can I take your name? It's Peter Chin. Okay, Peter. Well, if you want to ask about the job, and then if we're both still interested, we could arrange for you to come for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. I'm afraid I missed the advert for the job, but heard about it from a friend. That's no problem at all. What would you like to know? Well, um, what sort of work is it? Washing up? It's answering the phone. Oh, right. Fine. And not waiting at table. That'd be good. And how many nights a week would it be? Well, we're really only busy at the weekend. So two nights? Three actually. So it would work out at twelve hours a week. That'd be fine. It wouldn't interfere with my studies. Are you at the university? Yes, first year physics student. Oh right. Um, and because I'm not an EU national, would I need a work permit? Yes, you would. Just get your tutor to sign it. That wouldn't be a problem if I were to get the job.、Um, 
Where exactly is the restaurant? Well, we have two branches. The one we're recruiting for is in Hillsdon Road.、Uh, I don't know that.、Uh, how do you spell it, please? It's H I L L S D U N E Road. Got that. Thanks. Is it near a bus stop? Yes. The nearest one would probably be just beside the library. Oh yes, I know it. That'd be fine for me. And could I ask about the pay? We're offering four pounds forty-five an hour. That's very good. My last job was three pounds ninety-five an hour. We feel it's pretty good, and we also offer some good fringe benefits. Really? Well, we give you a free dinner, so you eat well. Right. Better than hostel food. <laughs> we certainly hope so, and we also offer extra pay for working on national holidays. Oh, that's a really good perk, isn't it? Yes, we think so. And then, because of the difficulties of getting public transport, if you're working after eleven o'clock, we drive you home. Oh, that's good to know. Well, we'd certainly be interested in inviting you for an interview if you're still interested. Oh yes, certainly. Could I just also ask what qualities you're looking for? Well, for this particular job, we want a clear voice, which you obviously do have. <laughs> Thanks. And you must be able to think quickly, you know. Well, I hope I. So, when could you come in for an interview? We're actually quite quiet tonight. Uh, sorry, I couldn't come tonight or tomorrow. I'm afraid.、Uh, Thursday's okay. That'd be twenty-second of October. Fine. After five p.m. Yes, fine. Would. Six o'clock be okay. Perfect. And could you bring along the names of two referees? Yes, that's fine. No problem. Good. I look forward to seeing you. Oh,、uh, by the way, who should I ask for? Oh yes, of course. Sorry, my name is Samira Manuja. Uh, can you spell that, please? M A N U J A. Okay, I've got that. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you later on then. Section two. Now we go to Jane, who is going to tell us about what's happening in town this weekend. Right. Thanks, Andrew. And now on to what's new. And do we really need yet another sports shop in Bradcaster? Well, most of you probably know Sports World, the branch of a Danish sports goods company that opened a few years ago. It's attracted a lot of custom. And so the company has now decided to open another branch in the area. It's going to be in the shopping centre to the west of Bradcaster, so that will be good news for all of you who found the original shop in the north of the town hard to get to. I was invited to a special preview, and I can promise you, this is the ultimate in sports retailing. The whole place has been given a new minimalist look with the company's signature colours of black and red. The first three floors have a huge range of sports clothing as well as equipment, and on the top floor there's a cafe and a book and DVD section. You'll find all the well-known names as well as some less well-known ones. If they haven't got exactly what you want in stock, they promise to get it for you in ten days, unlike the other store where it can take up to fourteen days. They cover all the major sports. Including football, tennis, and swimming, but they particularly focus on running, and they claim to have the widest range of equipment in the country. As well as that, a whole section of the third floor is devoted to sports bags, including the latest designs from the states. If you can't find what you want here, it doesn't exist. The shop will be open from 9 a.m. this Saturday. And if you go along to the opening, then you'll have the chance to meet the national 400 meters running champion Paul King, who's coming along to open the shop, and he will be staying around until about midday to chat to any fans who want to meet him and sign autographs. Then there will be a whole range of special attractions all weekend. There will be free tickets for local sporting events for the first 50 customers. And also a special competition open to all. Just answer 15 out of 20 sports questions correctly to win a signed copy of Paul King's DVD Spring Tips. While the first person to get all the questions correct 
gets a year's free membership of the Bradcaster Gym. All entrants will receive a special sports calendar with details of all Bradcaster fixtures in the coming year. One of the special opening offers is a fitness test, a complete review of your cardiac fitness and muscle tone, actually done in the shop by qualified staff. This would normally cost £30, but is available at half price for this month only. There are only a limited number of places available for this, so to make a booking, phone 560341. In addition, if you open an account, you get lots more special offers, including the chance to try out equipment at special open evenings. Section 3 Before we start, Spiros and Hiroko, thanks for coming in today to talk about your recent study experiences, and congratulations to you both in doing so well in your first semester exams. Thank you. I'd like to discuss with you the value of the English for Academic Purposes course you did here last year before starting your university course. Uh, Spiros, if I could start with you, what parts of the program have now proved to be particularly valuable to you? Um, I think that having to do a seminar presentation really helped me. For example, a couple of weeks ago in our marketing subject, when it was my turn to give a presentation, I felt quite confident. Of course, I was still nervous, but because I had done one before, I knew what to expect. Hmm. Also, I know I was well prepared, and I had practiced my timing. In fact, I think that in relation to some of the other people in my group, I did quite a good job, because my overall style was quite professional. What about you, Hiroko? Mm, that's interesting. In my group, I was really surprised by the way the students did their presentations. They just read their notes aloud. Can you believe that? They didn't worry about their presentation style or keeping eye contact with their audience. And I remember that these things were really stressed to us in the course here. So how did you approach your presentation, Hiroko? Well, to speak frankly, I read my notes too. <laughs> At the time, it was a relief to do it this way, but actually, when I had finished, I didn't feel any real sense of satisfaction. I didn't feel positive about the experience at all. That's a pity. You know, although I was pleased with my presentation, I am not so pleased with my actual performance right now in the tutorials. During the whole semester, I've not said anything in our tutorial discussions. Not a word. Really, Spiros? Why is that? Do the other students talk too much? It's partly that, but it's mostly because I have had no confidence to speak out. Their style of speaking is so different. It's not the style we were used to during the course. They use so many colloquialisms. They're not very polite, and sometimes there seems to be no order in their discussion. Also, they are very familiar with each other, so because they know each other's habits, they can let each other into the discussion. You're right, Spiros. I have experienced that too. For most of this semester, I've said absolutely nothing in tutorials. But recently, I've been trying to speak up more, and I just jump in. And I've noticed an interesting thing. I've noticed that if they thought my point was interesting or new, then the next time they actually asked for my opinion. And then it was much easier for me to be part of the discussion. Oh, that's great, Hiroko. I hope that happens for me next semester. I'll have to work hard to find some interesting points. What helped you to find these ideas? I think that one thing that helped me with this was the reading. I've had to do so much reading this semester just to help me make sense of the lectures. At first, I couldn't understand what the lectures were talking about, so I had to turn to the books and journals. Every night I read for hours using the lists of references that were given, and I made pages of notes. At breakfast, I read and read my notes again. This habit has helped me to follow the ideas in the lectures, and it's also given me some ideas to use in the tutorials. But I did so much reading anyway. I don't think there's any time left over for anything extra. My reading speed is still quite slow, though I'm much better at dealing with vocabulary than I used to be. What else do you think we could add to the course program to help with this reading problem? 
Hmm. Uh, there's not really anything because it's my problem. I remember we were given long articles to read. We didn't like that, but now I realize that reading those long articles was good preparation for the things I need to read now. Also, uh, in class, we regularly had speed reading tasks to do, and we kept a record of our reading speed, so the teachers were encouraging us to work on that. That's true, Spiros. But what we read could have been different. Sometimes in the English class, I felt frustrated when I had to read articles about the environment or health or education, because I wanted to concentrate on my own field. But we didn't read anything about engineering, so I think I wasted some time learning vocabulary I didn't need.、Mm, but surely the strategies you were taught for dealing with that vocabulary were helpful. Yes, but psychologically speaking. I would have felt much better working on reading from my own field.、Mm. What do you think, Spiros? Oh, I agree. That would have helped my confidence too, and I would have been more motivated. It was good, though, that we could work on our own topics when we wrote the research assignments. Okay, let's move on to writing now. Section four. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, with some of you about to go out on field work, it's timely that in this afternoon session I'll be sharing some ideas about the reasons why groups of whales and dolphins sometimes swim ashore from the sea right onto the beach, and most often die in what are known as mass strandings. Unfortunately, this type of event is a frequent occurrence in some of the locations that you'll be travelling to, where sometimes the tide goes out suddenly. Confusing the animals. However, there are many other theories about the causes of mass strandings. The first is that the behaviour is linked to parasites. It's often found that stranded animals were infested with large numbers of parasites. For instance, a type of worm is commonly found in the ears of dead whales. Since marine animals rely heavily on their hearing to navigate. This type of infestation has the potential to be very harmful. Another theory is related to toxins or poisons. These have also been found to contribute to the death of many marine animals. Many toxins, as I'm sure you're aware, originate from plants or animals. The whale ingests these toxins in its normal feeding behaviour, but whether these poisons directly or indirectly lead to stranding and death seems to depend upon the toxin involved. In 1988, for example, 14 humpback whales examined after stranding along the beaches of Cape Cod were found to have been poisoned after eating tuna that contained saxitoxin, the same toxin that can be fatal in humans. Alternatively, it has also been suggested that some animals strand accidentally by following their prey ashore in the confusion of the chase. In 1995, David Thurston monitored pilot whales that beached after following squid ashore. However, this idea does not seem to hold true for the majority of mass strandings, because examination of the animals' stomach contents revealed that most had not been feeding as they stranded. There are also some new theories which link strandings to humans. A growing concern is that loud noises in the ocean cause strandings. Noises such as those caused by military exercises are of particular concern, and have been pinpointed as the cause of some strandings of late. One of these, a mass stranding of whales in 2000 in the Bahamas, coincided closely with experiments using a new submarine detection system. There were several factors that made this stranding stand out as different from previous strandings. This led researchers to look for a new cause. For one, all the stranded animals were healthy. In addition, the animals were spread out along 38 kilometers of coast, whereas it's more common for the animals to be found in a group when mass strandings occur. A final theory is related to group behavior. And suggests that sea mammals cannot distinguish between sick and healthy leaders, and will follow sick leaders, even to an inevitable death. This is a particularly interesting theory, since the whales that are thought to be most social, the toothed whales, are the group that strand the most frequently. 
The theory is also supported by evidence from a dolphin stranding in 1994. Examination of the dead animals revealed that, apart from the leader, all the others had been healthy at the time of their death. Without one consistent theory, however, it is very hard for us to do anything about this phenomenon except to assist animals where and when we can. Stranding networks have been established around the world to aid in rescuing animals and collecting samples from those that could not be helped. I recommend John Connor's Marine Mammals Ashore as an excellent starting point if you're interested in finding out more about these networks or establishing one yourself. Section 1 Hi, can I help you? I'd like to find out if you have any excursions suitable for families. Sure. How about taking your family for a cruise? We have a steamship that takes passengers out several times a day. It's over a hundred years old. That sounds interesting. How long is the trip? About an hour and a half. And don't forget to take pictures of the mountains. They're all around you when you're on the boat and they look fantastic. Okay. And I assume there's a cafe or something on board? Sure. How old are your children? Uh, my daughter's 15 and my son's 7. Right. Well, there are various things you can do once you've crossed the lake to make a day of it. One thing that's very popular is a visit to the country farm. You're met off the boat by the farmer and he'll take you to the holding pens where the sheep are kept. Children love feeding them. <laughs> my son would love that. He really likes animals. Well, there's also a 40-minute trek round the farm on a horse if he wants. Do you think he'd manage it? He hasn't done that before. Sure. It's suitable for complete beginners. Good. And again, visitors are welcome to explore the farm on their own, as long as they take care to close gates and so on. There are some very beautiful gardens along the side of the lake, which also belong to the farm. They'll be just at their best now. You could easily spend an hour or two there. Okay, well, that all sounds good. And can we get lunch there? You can, and it's very good, though it's not included in the basic cost. You pay when you get there. Right. So, is there anything else to do over on that side of the lake? Well, what you can do is take a bike over on the ship and then go on a cycling trip. There's a trail there called the Back Road. You could easily spend three or four hours exploring it, and the scenery's wonderful. They'll give you a map when you get your ticket for the cruise. There's no extra charge. What's the trail like in terms of difficulty? Quite challenging in places. It wouldn't be suitable for your seven-year-old. It needs someone who's got a bit more experience. Hmm. Well, my daughter loves cycling, and so do I, so maybe the two of us could go, and my wife and son could stay on the farm. That might work out quite well. But we don't have bikes here. Is there somewhere we could rent them? Yes, there's a place here in the city. It's called Ratchison's. I'll just make a note of that. Uh, how do you spell it? R-A-T-C-H-E-S-O-N-S. -S. It's just by the cruise ship terminal. Okay. You'd also need to pick up a repair kit for the bike from there to take along with you. And you'd need to take along a snack and some water. It'd be best to get those in the city. Fine. That shouldn't be a problem. And I assume I can rent a helmet from the bike place. Sure, you should definitely get that. It's a great ride, but you want to be well prepared because it's very remote. You won't see any shops around there or anywhere to stay, so you need to get back in time for the last boat. Yeah. So what sort of prices are we looking at here? Let's see. That'd be one adult and one child for the cruise with farm tour. That's... $117, and an adult and a child for the cruise only, so that's $214 altogether. Oh, wait a minute. How old did you say your daughter was? Fifteen. Then I'm afraid it's $267, because she has to pay the adult fare, which is $75, instead of the child fare, which is $22. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so how do we... Section 2. Good morning, everyone. 
My name's Joy Parkins, and I'm the restaurant manager. And I understand that none of you have had any previous experience as kitchen assistants. Well, you might be feeling a bit nervous now, but most of our kitchen assistants say they enjoy the work. OK, they might get shouted at sometimes, but it's nothing personal. And they're pleased that they have so many different things to do, which means they never get bored. And I'll tell you straight away that if you do well, we might think about moving you up and giving you some more responsibility. Right, well, you've all shown up on time, which is an excellent start. Now, I'm glad to see none of you have unsuitable footwear, so that's good. You need to be careful as the floors can get very wet and slippery. Those of you with long hair have got it well out of the way, but some of you will need to remove your rings and bracelets. Just put them somewhere safe for today and remember to leave them at home tomorrow as they can be a safety hazard. Now, it's going to be a busy day for you all today. We don't have any tables free for this evening and only a few for lunch. Fortunately, we've got our head chef back. He was away on holiday all last week, which meant the other chefs had extra work. Now, I'll tell you a bit more about the job in a minute, but first, some general regulations. For all of you, whatever your age, there's some equipment you mustn't use until you've been properly trained, like the waste disposal system, for example, for health and safety reasons. Then I think there are two of you here who are under 18. That's Emma and Jake, isn't it? Right. So, for you two, the meat slicer is out of bounds. And, of course, none of you are allowed to use the electric mixer until you've been shown how it works. Now, you may have heard that this can be a stressful job. And I have to say, that can be true. You'll be working an eight-hour day for the first week, though you'll have the chance to do overtime after that as well if you want to. But... However long the hours are, you'll get a break in the middle. What you will find is that you're on your feet all day long, lifting and carrying. So, if you're not fit now, you soon will be. You'll find you don't have much chance to take it easy. When someone tells you to do something, you need to do it straight away. But at least we do have a very efficient air conditioning system, compared with some kitchens. Now, let me tell you about some of the people you need to know. So, as I said, I'm Joy Parkins, and I decide who does what during the day and how long they work for. I'll be trying to get you to work with as many different people in the kitchen as possible, so that you learn while you're on the job. One person whose name you must remember is David Field. If you injure yourself at all, even if it's really minor, you must report to him and he'll make sure the incident is recorded and you get the appropriate treatment. He's trained to give basic treatment to staff himself or he'll send you off somewhere else if necessary. Then there's Dexter Wills. He's the person you need to see if you smash a plate or something like that. Don't just leave it and hope no one will notice. It's really important to get things noted and replaced or there could be problems later. And finally, there's Mike Smith. He's the member of staff who takes care of all the stores of perishables. So, if you notice we're getting low in flour or sugar or something, make sure you let him know so he can put in an order. OK, now the next thing we need to cover... Section 3 OK, Stuart, we need to start planning our paper on public libraries. Have you thought of an angle yet? Well, there's so much we could look into. How libraries have changed over the centuries, for instance, or how different countries organise them. What do you think, Trudy? Maybe we should concentrate on this country and try and relate the changes in libraries to external developments, like the fact that far more people can read than a century ago, mm. and that the local population may speak lots of different languages. We could include something about changes in the source of funding, too. 
Yes, but remember we're only supposed to write a short paper, so it's probably best if we don't go into funding in any detail. Right. Well, shall we just brainstorm a few ideas to get started? OK. We obviously need to look at the impact of new technology, particularly the internet. Now that lots of books have been digitalised, people can access them from their own computers at home. And if everyone did that, libraries would be obsolete. Yes. But the digitalised books that are available online for free are mostly out of copyright, aren't they? And copyright in this country lasts for 70 years after the author dies. So you won't find the latest bestseller or up-to-date information. That's an important point. Anyway, I find it hard to concentrate when I'm reading a long text on a screen. I'd much rather read a physical book. And it takes longer to read on a screen. Oh, I prefer it. I suppose it's just a personal preference. Mm, I expect the libraries will go on evolving in the next few years. Some have already become centres where community activities take place, like local clubs meeting there. I think that'll become even more common. I'd like to think so. And that they'll still be serving their traditional function. But I'm not so sure. There are financial implications after all. What I'm afraid will happen is that books and magazines will all disappear and they'll just be rows and rows of computers. They won't look anything like the libraries we're used to. Well, we'll see. I've just had an idea. Why don't we make an in-depth study of our local public library as background to our paper? Yes, that'd be interesting. And raise all sorts of issues. Let's make a list of possible things we could ask about, then work out some sort of structure. For instance, um, we could interview some of the staff and find out whether the library has its own budget or if that's controlled by the local council. And what their policies are. I know they don't allow food, but I'd love to find out what types of noise they ban. There always seems to be a lot of talking, but never music. Mm. I don't know if that's a policy or it just happens. Oh, I've often wondered. Then there are things like how the library is affected by employment laws. I suppose there are rules about working hours, facilities for staff and so on. Right. Then there are other issues relating to the design of the building and how customers use it, like what measures does the library take to ensure their safety? They'd need floor coverings that aren't slippery, and emergency exits, for instance. Mm. Oh, and another thing, there's the question of the kind of insurance the library needs to have in case anyone gets injured. Yes, that's something else to find out. You know something I've often wondered? What's that? Well, you know they've got an archive of local newspapers going back years. Well, next to it, they've got the diary of a well-known politician from the late 19th century. I wonder why it's there. Do you know what his connection was with this area? No idea. Let's add it to our list of things to find out. Oh, I've just thought, you know people might ask in the library about local organisations like sports clubs. Mm. Well, I wonder if they keep a database or whether they just look online. Right. I quite fancy finding out what the differences are between a library that's open to the public and one that's part of a museum, for example. They must be very different. Hmm. Then something else I'd like to know is... Section 4. In public discussion of business, we take certain values for granted. Today, I'm going to talk about four of them. Collaboration, hard work, creativity and excellence. Most people would say they're all good things. I'm going to suggest that's an over-simple view. The trouble with these values is that they're theoretical concepts removed from the reality of day-to-day -day business. Pursue values by all means, but be prepared for what may happen as a result. They can actually cause damage, which is not at all the intention. Business leaders generally try to do the right thing, but all too often the right thing backfires if those leaders adopt values without understanding and managing the side effects that arise. The values can easily get in the way of what's actually intended. OK, so the first value I'm going to discuss is collaboration. Uh, let me give you an example. On a management training course I once attended, we were put into groups and had to construct a bridge across a stream using building blocks that we were given. The rule was that everyone in the team, 
had to move at least one building block during the construction. This was intended to encourage teamwork. But it was really a job best done by one person. The other teams tried to collaborate on building the structure and descended into confusion, with everyone getting in each other's way. Our team leader solved the challenge brilliantly. She simply asked everyone in the team to move a piece a few centimetres to comply with the rule and then let the person in the team with an aptitude for puzzles like this build it alone. We finished before any other team. My point is that the task wasn't really suited to team working, so why make it one? Teamwork can also lead to inconsistency, a common cause of poor sales. In the case of a smartphone that a certain company launched, one director wanted to target the business market and another demanded it was aimed at consumers. The company wanted both directors to be involved, so gave the product a consumer-friendly name but marketed it to companies. The result was that it met the needs of neither group. It would have been better to let one director or the other have his way. Not both. Part 1 Hello, William. This is Amber. You said to phone if I wanted to get more information about the job agency you mentioned. Is now a good time? Uh, hi, Amber. Yes, fine. So the agency I was talking about is called Bankside. They're based in Docklands. I can tell you the address now. 497 Eastside. OK, thanks. So, is there anyone in particular I should speak to there? The agent I always deal with is called Becky Jameson. Let me write that down. Becky... Jameson. J-A-M-I-E-S-O-N. Do you have her direct line? Yes, it's in my contacts somewhere. Uh, right, here we are. 07866510333. I wouldn't call her until the afternoon if I were you. She's always really busy in the morning trying to fill last minute vacancies. She's really helpful and friendly, so I'm sure it would be worth getting in touch with her for an informal chat. It's mainly clerical and admin jobs they deal with, isn't it? That's right. I know you're hoping to find a full time job in the media eventually but Becky mostly recruits temporary staff for the finance sector, which will look good on your CV and generally pays better too. Yeah, I'm just a bit worried because I don't have much office experience. I wouldn't worry. They'll probably start you as a receptionist or something like that. So what's important for that kind of job isn't so much having business skills or knowing lots of different computer systems. It's communication that really matters, so you'd be fine there and you'll pick up office skills really quickly on the job. It's not that complicated. OK, good. So how long do people generally need temporary staff for? It would be great if I could get something lasting at least a month. That shouldn't be too difficult. But you're more likely to be offered something for a week at first, which might get extended. It's unusual to be sent somewhere for just a day or two. Right. I've heard the pay isn't too bad. Better than working in a shop or a restaurant. Oh, yes, definitely. The hourly rate is about £10, 11 if you're lucky. That's pretty good. I was only expecting to get £8 or £9 an hour. Do you want me to tell you anything about the registration process? Yes, please. I know you have to have an interview. The interview usually takes about an hour, and you should arrange that about a week in advance. I suppose I should dress smartly if it's for office work. I can probably borrow a suit from Mum. Good idea. It's better to look too smart than too casual. Will I need to bring copies of my exam certificates or anything like that? No, they don't need to see those, I don't think. What about my passport? Oh, yes, they will ask to see that. OK. I wouldn't get stressed about the interview, though. It's just a chance for them to build a relationship with you so they can try and match you to a job which you'll like. So there are questions about personality that they always ask candidates, fairly basic ones, and they probably won't ask anything too difficult, 
like what your plans are for the future. <laughs> Hope not. Anyway, there are lots of benefits to using an agency. For example, the interview will be useful because they'll give you feedback on your performance, so you can improve next time. And they'll have access to jobs which aren't advertised. Exactly, most temporary jobs aren't advertised. And I expect finding a temporary job this way takes a lot less time. It's much easier than ringing up individual companies. Yes, indeed. Well, I think I've covered it. Part two. Good morning. My name's Erica Matthews, and I'm the owner of Matthews Island Holidays, a company set up by my parents. Thank you for coming to this presentation, in which I hope to interest you in what we have to offer. We're a small, family-run company, and we believe in the importance of the personal touch. So we don't aim to compete with other companies on the number of customers. What we do is build on our many years' experience, more than almost any other rail holiday company, to ensure we provide perfect holidays in a small number of destinations, which we've got to know extremely well. I'll start with our six-day Isle of Man holiday. This is a fascinating island in the Irish Sea, with Wales to the south, England to the east, Scotland to the north, and Northern Ireland to the west. Our holiday starts in Heesham, where your tour manager will meet you. Then you'll travel by ferry to the Isle of Man. Some people prefer to fly from Luton instead. And another popular option is to go by train to Liverpool and take a ferry from there. You have five nights in the hotel, and the price covers five breakfasts and dinners and lunch on the three days when there are organised trips. Day four is free, and most people have lunch in a cafe or restaurant in Douglas. The price of the holiday includes the ferry to the Isle of Man, all travel on the island. The hotel and the meals I've mentioned. Incidentally, we try to make booking our holidays as simple and fair as possible. So, unlike with many companies, the price is the same whether you book six months in advance or at the last minute. And there's no supplement for single rooms in hotels. If you make a booking then need to change the start date, for example because of illness, you're welcome to change to an alternative date or a different tour. For a small administrative fee. Okay, so what does the holiday consist of? Well, on day one, you'll arrive in time for a short introduction by your tour manager, followed by dinner in the hotel. The dining room looks out at the river, close to where it flows into the harbour, and there's usually plenty of activity going on. On day two, you'll take the coach to the small town of Peel. On the way, calling in at the Tinwald Exhibition, the Isle of Man isn't part of the United Kingdom, and it has its own Parliament called Tinwald. It's claimed that this is the world's oldest Parliament that's still functioning, and that it dates back to 979. However, the earliest surviving reference to it is from 1422. So. Perhaps it isn't quite as old as it claims. <laughs> Day three, we have a trip to the mountain Snaefell. This begins with a leisurely ride along the promenade in Douglas in a horse-drawn tram. Then you board an electric train, which takes you to the fishing village of Laxey. From there, it's an eight-kilometre ride in the Snaefell Mountain Railway to the top. Lunch will be in the cafe. Giving you spectacular views of the island. Day four is free for you to explore using the pass which we'll give you, so you won't have to pay for travel on local transport or for entrance to the island's heritage sites. Or you might just want to take it easy in Douglas and perhaps do a little light shopping. The last full day, day five, is for some people the highlight of the holiday. With a ride on the steam railway from Douglas to Port Erin, after some time to explore, a coach will take you to the headland that overlooks the Calf of Man, a small island just off the coast. 
From there, you continue to Castle Town, which used to be the capital of the Isle of Man and its medieval castle. And on day six, it's back to the ferry, or the airport if you flew to the island, and time to go home. Now, I'd like to tell you a bit more. Part three. Ed, how are you getting on with the reading for our presentation next week? Well, OK, Ruth, but there's so much of it. I know. I hadn't realised birth order was such a popular area of research. But the stuff on birth order and personality is mostly unreliable. From what I've been reading, a lot of the claims about how your position in the family determines certain personality traits are just stereotypes, with no robust evidence to support them. OK, but that's an interesting point. We could start by outlining what previous research has shown. There are studies going back over a hundred years. Yeah, so we could just run through some of the typical traits. Like the consensus seems to be that oldest children are generally less well-adjusted because they never get over the arrival of a younger sibling. Right, but on a positive note, some studies claim that they were thought to be good at nurturing. Certainly in the past, when people had large families, they would have been expected to look after the younger ones. There isn't such a clear picture for middle children, but one trait that a lot of the studies mention is that they are easier to get on with than older or younger siblings. Hmm, generally eager to please and helpful, although that's certainly not accurate as far as my family goes. My middle brother was a nightmare, always causing fights and envious of whatever I had. As I said, none of this seems to relate to my own experience. I'm the youngest in my family, and I don't recognise myself in any of the studies I've read about. I'm supposed to have been a sociable and confident child who made friends easily, but I was actually terribly shy. Really? That's funny. There have been hundreds of studies on twins, but mostly about nurture versus nature. There was one on personality which said that a twin is likely to be quite shy in social situations because they always have their twin around to depend on for support. My cousins were like that when they were small. They were only interested in each other and found it hard to engage with other kids. They're fine now, though. Only children have had a really bad press. A lot of studies have branded them as loners who think the world revolves around them because they've never had to fight for their parents' attention. That does seem a bit harsh. One category I hadn't considered before was children with much older siblings. A couple of studies mentioned that these children grow up more quickly and are expected to do basic things for themselves, like getting dressed. I can see how that might be true, although I expect they're sometimes the exact opposite, playing the baby role and clamouring for special treatment. What was the problem with most of these studies, do you think? I think it was because, in a lot of cases, data was collected from only one sibling per family, who rated him or herself and his or her siblings at the same time. Hmm. Some of the old research into the relationship between birth order and academic achievement has been proved to be accurate, though. Performances in intelligence tests declined slightly from the eldest child to his or her younger siblings, this has been proved in lots of recent studies. Yes, although what many of them didn't take into consideration was family size. The more siblings there are, the likelier the family is to have a low socio-economic status, which can also account for differences between siblings in academic performance. The oldest boy might be given more opportunities than his younger sisters, for example. Exactly. But the main reason for the marginally higher academic performance of oldest children is quite surprising, I think. It's not only that they benefit intellectually from extra attention at a young age, which is what I would have expected. It's that they benefit from being teachers for their younger siblings by verbalising processes. Right. And this gives them status and confidence, which again contributes in a small way to better performance. So... Would you say sibling rivalry has been a useful thing for you? I think so. My younger brother was incredibly annoying, and we fought a lot. But I think this has made me a stronger person. I know how to defend myself. 
We had some terrible arguments, and I would have died rather than apologise to him. But we had to put up with each other, and most of the time we coexisted amicably enough. Yes, my situation was pretty similar. But I don't think having two older brothers made me any less selfish. I was never prepared to let my brothers use any of my stuff. That's perfectly normal. Whereas some Part four. Today, I'm going to talk about the eucalyptus tree. This is a very common tree here in Australia, where it's also sometimes called the gum tree. First, I'm going to talk about why it's important. Then, I'm going to describe some problems it faces at present. Right. Well, the eucalyptus tree is an important tree for lots of reasons. For example. It gives shelter to creatures like birds and bats, and these and other species also depend on it for food, particularly the nectar from its flowers. So it supports biodiversity. It's useful to us humans too because we can kill germs with a disinfectant made from oil extracted from eucalyptus leaves. The eucalyptus grows all over Australia, and the trees can live for up to 400 years. So it's alarming that all across the country numbers of eucalyptus are falling because the trees are dying off prematurely. So what are the reasons for this? One possible reason is disease. As far back as the 1970s. The trees started getting a disease called Mundula yellows. The tree's leaves would gradually turn yellow, then the tree would die. It wasn't until 2004 that they found the cause of the problem was lime or calcium hydroxide, to give it its proper chemical name, which was being used in the construction of roads. The lime was being washed away into the ground and affecting the roots of the eucalyptus trees nearby. What it was doing was preventing the trees from sucking up the iron they needed for healthy growth. When this was injected back into the affected trees, they immediately recovered. But this problem only affected a relatively small number of trees. By 2000. Huge numbers of eucalyptus were dying along Australia's east coast of a disease known as Bell Minor-associated dieback. The Bell Minor is a bird, and the disease seems to be common where there are high populations of Bell Miners. Again, it's the leaves of the trees that are affected. What happens is that insects settle on the leaves and eat their way round them. Destroying them as they go, and at the same time they secrete a solution which has sugar in it. The bell miner birds really like this solution, and in order to get as much as possible, they keep away other creatures that might try to get it. So these birds and insects flourish at the expense of other species, and eventually so much damage is done to the leaves that the tree dies. But experts say that trees can start looking sick before any sign of Bell Minor associated dieback, so it looks as if the problem might have another explanation. One possibility is that it's to do with the huge bushfires that we have in Australia. A theory proposed over 40 years ago by ecologist William Jackson. Is that the frequency of bushfires in a particular region affects the type of vegetation that grows there? If there are very frequent bushfires in a region, this encourages grass to grow afterwards. While if the bushfires are rather less frequent, this results in the growth of eucalyptus forests. So why is this? Why do fairly frequent bushfires? Actually, support the growth of eucalyptus. Well, one reason is that the fire stops the growth of other species, which would consume water needed by eucalyptus trees. And there's another reason. 
If these other quick-growing species of bushes and plants are allowed to proliferate, they harm the eucalyptus in another way by affecting the composition of the soil and removing nutrients from it. So some bushfires are actually essential for the eucalyptus to survive, as long as they are not too frequent. In fact, there's evidence that Australia's indigenous people practiced regular burning of bushland for thousands of years before the arrival of the Europeans. But since Europeans arrived on the continent, the number of bushfires has been strictly controlled. Now scientists believe that this reduced frequency of bushfires to low levels has led to what's known as dry rainforest. Which seems an odd name, as usually we associate tropical rainforest with wet conditions. And what's special about this type of rainforest? Well, unlike tropical rainforest, which is a rich ecosystem, this type of ecosystem is usually a simple one. It has very thick, dense vegetation, but not much variety of species. The vegetation provides lots of shade, so one species that does find it ideal is the bell miner bird, which builds its nests in the undergrowth there. But again, that's not helpful for the eucalyptus tree.